have a few speakers today, and our first speaker is kind of a special guest for us. He's not a, a regular member of our team all the time, though we read his name a lot on a lot of documents. It's uh, Peter Landris, and uh, Peter is a emeritus scientist, uh, retired from the Aldo Leopold Wilderness Research Institute, and he was uh, one of the originators, very involved in uh, developing the idea of wilderness character and the wilderness character monitoring frameworks that are used kind of in an interagency way today uh, across all of our national wilderness uh, preservation system areas. So uh, Peter's going to be talking about the history of WCM, and I think he's, he's is he looking ready? I yeah, think. yep, yep, yep. All looking right, ready. all right, Peter, that's, that's your intro. Let's, okay. let's go. Okay, I'm not looking quite as ready as your lava lamp, which um, I'm totally envious of, but because I haven't seen one of those in a long time. It's awesome. I'm going to share my screen. This is a PowerPoint presentation that I will be talking from. And I think it's ready to go. I assume everybody can see this okay. Okay, um, so I'm gonna be talking about really the history of wilderness character monitoring, like Jim said. And um, the reason I'm um, I was asked to give this presentation is that, as Jim said, I've kind of been in the, on the ground floor and maybe um, kind of below the ground floor digging the foundation for just about um, all of the agency efforts for wilderness character monitoring. I've been a chair or co-chair of um, Forest Service, Fish and Wildlife Service, and Park Service teams developing wilderness character monitoring. So I'm not going to talk about, you know, what wilderness character is and all that, because Kate's going to go into that and provide some good detail. Instead, I'm going to talk about really, you know, how and why we got here today. Um, how did we create, why did we create um, wilderness character monitoring to begin with? Um, how did we get involved with all this? Um, you know, uh, the, the final interagency product was Keeping It Wild 2, shown on the screen here. And then ultimately the Forest Service Wilderness Character Monitoring Technical Guide, which is the more the most recent publication that came out last year. So I'm going to really talk about like, you know, why and how we uh, did all this stuff. Um, and so, um, so let's start with really the basics. Um, I did have a, a spent quite a bit of few years backpacking on my own recreationally. And a lot of people, and I think still have this kind of idyllic, um, angelic view of wilderness, like, oh my gosh, it's so wonderful, so nice. It's for recreation, uh, it's fun and games. And, you know, we'll go out in groups. This is not a picture of me, but very much like what I did when I was a teenager. Um, really loved it. Uh, hippie days came and then kind of went. And that's me backpacking with a former uh, very close friend um, uh, and colleague, Steve Boucher in the, in the uh, Mount Bachelor area. And, you know, kids these days um, still backpack. So, you know, everything is rosy, right? You know, that was kind of where we were coming from. And, but there's, you know, we need to step, take a step back and in terms of wilderness stewardship, are there problems? And so these photos, all of these photos were taken inside a designated wilderness. And they certainly confront, I think, most people's understanding of what is appropriate inside wilderness. Um, these are just, you know, just highlighting some of the really big problems that wilderness managers face nationwide. So we know there's a bunch of problems. And so what, I'm, what I want to review quickly is based on almost 30 years of a lot of different people asking on the ground wilderness managers, is there a problem? What is the problem? And so what I'm going to do here is go through and really encapsulate a bunch of the major problems that were really the genesis of our work on wilderness character monitoring. So the first was just a, just a primary fundamental lack of understanding about what the legal mandate of the Wilderness Act is. And there really is a single very strong man legal mandate, and that's to preserve wilderness character. Um, and you, you poll people, talk with people about it, do they understand it? And the answer generally, um, at least in we started this effort, was no. Second, wilderness managers were just profoundly concerned about just um, their being forced to focus on, and in some cases just uh, that's what they wanted to do, just focus on certain activities 
at the expense of others. And you know, is there a big picture? What was what is that big picture? Uh, what should we be doing? What should we be focusing on? Should we be focusing on um, just impacts of campsites and trails, which is super important? Um, are there things that we're missing because of that focus? Um, so we started becoming increasingly concerned that people really we're missing the, the big view. And then related to this is that we were becoming increasingly concerned about um, a phenomenon uh, called shifting baselines. Um, when new staff come in, what they see on the ground defines their perception of what they think the reality is, not understanding what it had been. And so conditions can slowly degrade over time as new staff come in, as these baselines shift. Third, so, okay, so if we want to focus on wilderness character, how are we going to do it? Well, at the time, there were absolutely zero tools of, for managers to really understand the outcomes of their stewardship accomplishments in preserving wilderness character. So, big problem. And then we kept seeing just over and over and over again across all the agencies, just this tremendous lack of communication among staff about uh, what are what are the goals for wilderness management, wilderness stewardship? Uh, how does wilderness character fit into this? Um, what we just encountered over and over and over again is that each program area was siloed and people were not communicating with one another. So cultural resources wanted to do something or heritage wanted to do something, fire wants to do something, engineering wants to do something. And it's like, okay, let's just go into the wilderness and do it. Well, you know, that there could be some problems. So. There's a lot of problems that we were aware of. And this uh, Gary Larson cartoon really summed up in a lot of people's mind really what the problem was. You know, it's like the agency people, we need to make a decision, so do it. And you end up just getting basically screwed no matter what you do. You're damned if you do and damned if you don't. Um, so this just became just a really acute problem as, as we were struggling with this. Okay, so. In 2001, the Forest Service um, uh, formally asked Steve Boucher there and myself to um, pull together a team to develop national scale wilderness monitoring direction. And we had the benefit of just tremendous, tremendous people at all levels, all the way down from uh, field level to the RPMs, uh, the, excuse me, the regional program managers in the Forest Service. And we focused on the Forest Service. We, um, we did have representatives from the other agencies, but we knew that we were, this is gonna be a really heavy lift. And so we very, so Steve and I very purposefully made the decision to start within the Forest Service because that was the mandate of our individual team. And then we could spread out to the other agencies as they became interested and aware. Um, so we did have formal representation from the other agencies on our very first team. So we had tremendous direction. We could really do whatever we wanted to do. And the first several days uh, we spent like, well, what are we gonna do? We could do wildlife monitoring, but we're like, yeah, there's a lot of really good wildlife people out there. They know what they're doing. Oh, what about air monitoring? We could do that, yeah, there's really good air programs also. So we just started going through resource after resource after resource, thinking what should we be doing? What really should we be focusing on? And our, because our, we did not have an original mandate to focus on wilderness character. We developed that focus. So after about two or three days, we're like, hmm, you know, what should we do? So we all pull out our copies of the Wilderness Act, start scrutinizing it, and uh, it became pretty clear, oh, you know what? We are missing something really big. What about wilderness character? So then there was this collective head slap, forehead slap. It's like, yeah, we should do this, but holy cow, that wasn't quite the word we used, but you know, generally, holy cow, do we really wanna do this? It's a big, big lift. So we had just tremendous people, tremendously good people on these teams. And this is just a, a very small representation of some of the team, um, team members. Um, just stellar, stellar people. It totally was a, a village effort. Um, so why did we focus on wilderness character? So I'm gonna run through some just basic reasons. Um, the bottom line, it's the law. There are very clear statements in the Wilderness Act about how wilderness shall be administered, 
to preserve wilderness character. And those people who understand, you know, who are delve into the legal uh, frameworks of things, the word shall is super important. That means the agency does not have discretion. It needs to do this. So had we done it before? So picture Wilderness Act was passed in 1964. The words are here. We're at sitting in 2001. And to our knowledge, the concept of wilderness character had been virtually ignored up until then. So it's like, okay, let's roll up our sleeves. The law says we should do it. Let's give it a crack. Now all four wilderness managing agencies have very clear policy on preserving wilderness character. So, okay, so we have good support within the eight. So the law says do it. The policy supports doing that. The courts have clearly unequivocally said preserve wilderness character. All four agencies have gone through various legal battles. Peter Appel, uh, a lawyer who um, unfortunately passed away several years ago, did a compilation of over 287 court cases related to wilderness character. And the far, far majority of those cases said, and, I, and I'm showing all of these cases here, the agency was not protecting, preserving wilderness character. Courts said agencies get it together, you need to preserve wilderness character. Okay, so the law says do it, the policies support it, the courts have said do it. Where we were coming from was we wanted to improve wilderness stewardship. That was our bottom line. You know, there's a lot of laws that are not fulfilled, there's a lot of policy that kind of goes by the wayside. Um, even uh, course, case law is sometimes pushed aside. But, you know, our bottom line from everyone on the team was improved wilderness stewardship. And the big red circle there is we were not interested in just creating a document that sat on a shelf. We wanted to, how, what do we need to do to improve wilderness character, protect, protect wilderness character, and thereby improve wilderness stewardship on the ground. So these were our four broad goals of why we wanted to focus on wilderness character. First, we wanted to create this literally a comprehensive framework and language which hadn't been created before to improve communication, both within the, within the agency and with folks outside. We wanted to evaluate the effects of proposed actions, like from that um, damned if you do, damned if you don't Gary Larson cartoon. Everything has trade-offs. There's nothing that does not involve trade-offs. So to make an informed decision about proposed actions, you need to know what those trade-offs are. So we wanted to use the framework and language of wilderness character to understand those trade-offs. We wanted it to streamline and inform planning and decision-making from the team's experience. It seemed like a lot of decisions were uh, made by well-intended people, but just really seat of the pants reflecting their own value system, their own experience, and not really understanding what the impact of those decisions were on the broader agency mandate to protect and preserve wilderness character. And then the bottom line for us was increased transparency and accountability. We wanted to create a framework where the feet of the wilderness managers could be held to the fire. You know, so that would presumably, we assumed, create a framework for improving wilderness stewardship. Okay, so that was our individual um, reasons behind the people on the teams. And then the bottom line for us, we felt it was just the right thing to do. Um, you know, on these teams, it's mostly a bunch of wilderness nerds, um, which is awesome. Uh, it's really a fun thing to be able to work with people like that. And we, uh, a lot of people um, on the team had read this book, Wilderness Ethics by Laura and Guy Waterman, and it really had a big impact on us. And this became really kind of our mantra. You know, once land is designated as wilderness, how do we preserve the spirit of the land? You know, and so it's kind of intangible, kind of woo-woo, but it really um, gets at the core of who we who we were as people and what we really wanted to do to bring to wilderness stewardship. And then the really big bottom line was Howard Zonheiser in testimony to Congress about the Wilderness Act when he was grilled um, by various Congress people about, you know, what is this whole deal about wilderness? And he had this just totally clear statement. The purpose of the Wilderness Act is to preserve the wilderness character of the areas to be included, not to establish any particular use. It's like, boom, okay, we got it. You know, we know what we need to do. 
So the question was how? Okay, we know why. That was, that was like basically going through the why. So how are we going to do it? So we really felt like this, like the person um, kind of sitting on top of this uh, wheel in the Scary Larson cartoon is like, okay, no one has tackled this before. We're going to tackle it. And we want to be super careful that we don't just basically screw up uh, other people, other programs. So let's be very careful about how we move forward. So we asked ourselves these four basic questions as we started. What is it? In other words, what is wilderness character? How do we measure it? How do we monitor it? And how do we build it into the agency so it becomes institutionalized? Because a lot of people come up with really great things. And if they're not institutionalized, it's, um, Let's see, I'm trying to think of a polite way to say this. Um, it is just, it's ineffectual, it doesn't do anything. It makes people feel good about what they've done, but it doesn't have any bottom line impact. And that's what we wanted to have bottom line impact. Okay, first, so we established very specific goals for our effort to work on this committee. So our primary goal, primary number one thing, understand consequences of decisions and actions to improve on the ground stewardship. So that underlay, underlay, underlied, underlaid everything that we did. We wanted, and this is gonna re, um, sound quite repetitive. Um, we wanted to create uh, what I said earlier. We wanted to create this comprehensive framework and language to improve communication. We wanted to increase transparency, accountability, and defensibility. Fourth, we wanted to provide information, not just at the ground level, but information that could be rolled up through regional and national levels to evaluate policy effectiveness. So policy effectiveness would be evaluated based on on the ground stewardship. This just made sense to us. So we had to build that into everything we did. And last, we needed to provide a, just a solid, basis of data that would create legacy information to endure over time when staff change. And that combats this problem of shifting baselines. Okay, so first step, what is wilderness character? Uh, problem, because it's not defined in the Wilderness Act. So we have this clear legal direction to protect it, but there's no definition of wilderness character in the Wilderness Act. And I've done a lot of just the uh, uh, historic uh, legal research with various grad students on this. And um, I think we understand, you know, the rash, what was going on at the time. But the bottom line is that there is no uh, legal definition of wilderness character in the Wilderness Act. So our team was left to its own devices. So what we did is we started with the Wilderness Act and we dove in deeply into Section 2C the legal definition of wilderness. And then we define, not the Wilderness Act, but we define what we called qualities of wilderness character, big buckets of different things. And then as we defined these qualities of wilderness character, the three bullets there show the things that we based defining these qualities on. They needed to be tangible and practical, they needed to link on the ground management actions directly, not indirectly, but directly to the language of the Wilderness Act and agency policy. And they needed to apply to every single wilderness as well as agency. Um, and we all know that there's a tremendous variety of different type of um, ecosystems in the wilderness um, throughout the National Wilderness Preservation System. You know, so we needed, so what we came up with needed to apply to all of those things. So these are the five qualities of wilderness character that we developed. Um, I am not going to talk about these because Kate is going to go into detail about these, but I just wanted to show them. These are the five qualities that we came up with. And throughout everything, we we're really, really concerned about um, this kind of typical um, reductionistic method of approaching wilderness character, of tearing it apart into its qualities. And so, I saw this um, diagram on a plane flight in a magazine. And I went, ah, this, this is it. So we know that wilderness character is more than the sum of its parts. 
And we also know that if any of these parts, in other words, qualities are degraded, the whole thing does not work as it's intended when all those pieces come together. So we kept this picture in, all, in our minds as we did all of the work trying to develop the concept of wilderness character into a formal monitoring framework. So we started, in, I'm gonna go through just a pretty quick historical um, kind of rendering of our work on wilderness character. Um, we started in 2001 um, with this wilderness monitoring team. We did have representatives from the BLM, Fish and Wildlife Service and Park Service. And this Gary Larson cartoon, you probably get the sense that I like Gary Larson cartoons by now, but this really captured how a lot of this felt at the beginning. You know, we thought we had, you know, we. We, uh, we had some good goals. We were really trying to protect people at the field level. Uh, we, we had statisticians, you know, involved. But as we started giving presentations, all of our team members started going out nationally to give presentations. And we um, just got creamed. Uh, just people just kind of raked us up and down the coals. You know, it was, it was rough. So this cartoon really captured what we felt. In 2005, but we listened to all the feedback we got. And in 2005, we published this national monitoring strategy. And then our team got the go ahead from the Washington Office and the Forest Service to pull together a super large team to develop a practical implementation or technical guide that we published in 2009. And right at this time, the Forest Service was just embarking on the Wilderness Stewardship Program, WSP. And so a decision was made at the very top level in the Forest Service Wilderness Program to uh, take wilderness character monitoring and put it on a shelf. We had done a lot of developmental work, put it on a shelf to allow the Forest Service to focus on WSP, you know, totally reasonable decision. So at this time, as soon as we published the document on the left, that monitoring strategy, the Interagency Wilderness Steering Committee chartered, um, they asked me to chair an interagency team. Um, now keep in mind the Forest Service was strictly Forest Service. So the Steering Committee wanted to develop an interagency national monitoring strategy. So um, we worked for several years. We published this national interagency monitoring strategy, Keeping It Wild in 2008. At that point, then the other agencies started jumping in it's really big time. So BLM chartered a team to develop their national monitoring strategy. In 2010, the Fish and Wildlife Service and Park Service chartered teams to develop their own individual agency national monitoring strategy. Also in 2010, um, Nancy Roper and Peter Dratch with the Fish, of the Fish and Wildlife Service and I began the Wilderness Fellows Program that is still being carried on today very capably by the Society for Wilderness Stewardship and Jacob Wall, who was really involved in in this, um, this skills workshop is deeply involved in that. So it's really heartening to see. The Wilderness Fellows Program for me was just an absolute highlight of my career. Um, just, uh, just it was great, I loved it. Um, in 2014, the Park Service team published their massive user guide and planning handbook, just big, big detailed, really thorough, thorough documents, just real, a super, super good effort. Um, and then also in 2014, um, I was starting to become increasingly concerned about all the different uh, individual agency efforts we're really building on. We were leapfrogging one another to build and improve. And we really wanted to review the original Keeping It Wild document and provide recommendations for a possible Keeping It Wild 2 document, which we ultimately published in 2015. And at the same time, the Forest Service began work on its new Wilderness Character Monitoring Technical Guide. And this, um, the Forest Service document, the Technical Guide, was published last year. Um, I'm sure most people on this conference call or the Zoom meeting have seen Keeping It Wild too. Um, now, what I've presented is this very linear process, you know, and this looks very neat and orderly. That is like totally not reality. This is what it looks like looked like in reality. It was highly networked, interconnected. Oh my God, it was just a struggle. Um, but you can see this is what really happened. Uh, you can see at 2008 uh, with the first Keeping It Wild publication that really propelled all the other agencies to really jump on board. 
um, just a tremendous, co uh, tremendously complicated effort. Um, and you can see on the right-hand side of the screen, just a lot of pilot testing and review. Um, again, I mentioned the Wilderness Fellows were just a tremendous asset in really uh, doing a lot of uh, pilot testing, field testing, and getting input from the agencies. So altogether, when you look at the whole big picture, uh, we had about 140 um, agency staff were directly involved in developing all of these different documents. We formally had 844 agency pilot tests. We had uh, nearly 200 people doing reviews both inside and outside the agencies and just a lot of review comments. So it was a, just, it was a really heavy lift, um, but I think it was worthwhile. And, you know, it's just kind of makes me giddy to see the, um, the efforts that the agencies are doing right now. And Jim, okay, that was, oh yeah, you're, you're perfect timing. You, you must've done this before, sir. Uh, just once or twice. Yeah. <laughs> so that's it for me. Hey, that was great. I appreciate finally seeing that, uh, that presentation with the talk next to it, because I've seen it a lot, just statically. All right, so uh, thank you, Peter. I so appreciate it. And I meant to say earlier, I'm Jim Edmonds. I'm on the Forest Service uh, Wilderness Character uh, team. I'm a data analyst, which is why I don't know what I'm doing right now. And I also, on that team, work with our next speaker, who is Kate DeVrona. She's program manager with uh, Southern, well, it's App Appalachian from where I'm from, but you know, who knows? Uh, Southern Appalachian Wilderness Stewards, and she's gonna talk about wilderness character definition and quality some more, as Peter mentioned. So I'm gonna let you get right into it, Kate. All right, thanks, Jim. I'll go ahead and share my screen. Awesome. So I'm, thank you so much, Peter, for going into the history there. I'm really excited to um, speak after you and talk a little bit more about what Peter and a lot of those folks he identified helped develop over the years. Um, I'll be, um, it's really nice for me to hear from Peter as well because I've been working with uh, Wilderness Character Monitoring the last uh, five years or so and started as a Wilderness Fellow as he um, come in that program he mentioned. Um, but I'm Kate Deverona. I use she, her pronouns. I'm the program manager with SAWS, so for short. Um, I'm also a team leader on the Forest Service Wilderness Character Monitoring Central team. Um, I'm chatting with you today from the ancestral and contemporary lands of the Eastern Band of the Cherokee. And this is the nearest wilderness to me, uh, Shining Rock Wilderness, I wanted to share um, in North Carolina. Um, all right. So what I'm going to talk to you today about um, is wilderness character, kind of that definition that Peter and that team and that interagency team helped develop, and as well as some of the definitions, um, the wilderness character qualities that Peter highlighted there, as well as kind of a really brief overview of wilderness character monitoring framework. Um, so there's a lot of there's a lot of knowledge in the room, I recognize. So I want to invite folks to um, add in the chat anything I breeze over or things I might miss. So um, as Peter mentioned, the, the definition of wilderness character is not in the law itself, um, but the team, that interagency team was able to develop a definition um, that the agencies agreed on. And it, it's kind of built on these three components of what makes wilderness character. Um, it is definitely a holistic concept that includes biophysical environments, kind of that areas that are primarily free from modern human uh, manipulation and impact these, um, I'll use my mouse here, these personal experiences. Um, so in the like wilderness in the natural environment, relatively free from the signs of modern um, influence, as well as these symbolic meanings. Um, you know, wilderness character is, is humility and restraint and that interdependence on um, the inspiration of human connection with nature, which is really important. And kind of the, the combination of these three um, areas kind of is what defines wilderness character. Um, and these are outlined in the Keeping It Wild 2 book, which I have here, um, a special copy that I feel lucky to have. Um, and this, through that technical port that, that Peter identified is where um, 
the definition of woman's character and these qualities is, is outlined. So uh, woman's character definitely has some tangible and intangible qualities that I'll talk about in each of the five qualities coming up here. So there's that keeping it wild technical guide. Um, this was uh, an important piece that we're still using today. It kind of outlines the framework, um, gives a little bit of that history. One moment here. Gives a little bit of that history that Peter talked about, as well as defines um, the qualities. It's also uh, in use today and what we use to implement the wilderness character monitoring framework. And it's kind of that practical guidebook that all agencies are using. All right, so here are the five qualities of wilderness character. Um, first, I'll start by kind of reading, um, well, the first quality is untrammeled. I'll start by kind of reading some of those definitions pulled directly from the Wilderness Act. So wilderness is where the earth and its community of life are untrammeled by man um, and women, and generally appears to have been affected primarily by the forces of nature. So that language is taken right out of the act and kind of sums up what, what untrammeled is. So this is um, kind of a weird word, a unique word for wilderness folks who've been working with wilderness for a while. Um, no other federal land designation calls for the land to be untrammeled. So it's unique in our uh, public land system. And it is an old world word. It is originating from binding or hobbling a horse. Um, it's something that hinders um, I like to use the synonyms because it helps kind of sum up what untrammeled means. So some synonyms are unrestrained. So wilderness is unrestrained. It's unhindered. Um, a lot of unwords. It's unmanipulated or free and wild. So this is capturing what, what untrammeled is. Um, when we're talking about wilderness being untrammeled, we are talking about how a wilderness is managed. So kind of those actions. So this word is asking us to, to not act or to, to engage in humility or restraint when we're talking about untrammeled. Um, this word isn't, so the quality untrammeled is about actions, not about the land and the effects. Um, and we'll get into that in the next quality, but it's not about the condition of the land, but how we're managing it. So here's just a few examples of things that might degrade the untrammeled quality of wilderness character. Um, so untrammeled is kind of looking at two things here, actions that are authorized by a management agency and actions that are unauthorized. So these could be any of those things. Um, so we have a few examples here, maybe fish stocking in this area here, that's a, a management action. There is, um, in this area, they might put down a, a cage to block, uh, in this case, uh, some turtles so that they're able to nest without being disrupted. You have over here in this area, you know, the addressing non-native invasive species. And so in this um, quality, if sometimes actions may degrade this quality, but they are largely in an effort to improve other qualities or enhance other qualities of wilderness character, which we'll talk about here in a minute. All right. So our second quality of wilderness character is the natural quality. Um, the natural, these are some quotes again from the Wilderness Act. So wilderness is protected and managed so as to preserve its natural conditions. Um, wilderness retains its permeable character and influence. So this quality does encompass things like plants, the animals, air quality, um, water quality, and those ecological sy systems um, or processes like uh, uh, watershed condition, uh, disturbance factors, maybe landscape fragmentation, so big ecological processes like that. So this one is really important because wilderness is a place where, um, where where it's natural, where it's primeval, where the conditions of the ecosystem dominate in the landscape. And so this, this quality of wilderness character is about the state of the land um, and those biological processes. So these are capturing you know, the effects of modern human uh, civilization, the effects of management actions. 
So here's a few examples of things that might degrade natural, the natural quality. Um, you know, if you have presence of non-native invasive species um, that are um, creating a monoculture or out competing the native uh, plants and animals, you know, that would degrade the natural quality of wilderness character. Um, you have, you know, air quality if that's being um, impacted by a nearby metropolitan area or city or factory, you know, those things are degrading the natural quality of wilderness character. All right. So we have our third quality, um, wilderness is undeveloped. Um, so wilderness is, you know, direct quotes, an area of undeveloped federal land without permanent improvements or human habitation uh, with the imprint of man's work substantially unnoticed or where man himself is a visitor who does not remain. And so this quality may be the most familiar for um, folks out, outside the wilderness world um, to visitors, to the public. This is usually um, the thing people notice first or the most when they go out into a wilderness area. You won't, you typically wouldn't see, you know, your um, roads or administrative buildings or visitor centers, things like that. Um, and so this is kind of the most recognizable and provides, we'll go here, um, provides protection for those la landscapes that are absent of human and modern um, occupation. So here's a few examples of things that might degrade this particular quality, the undeveloped quality. Um, examples of developments can be permanent or temporary. So you might have permanent something permanent here, like maybe a bathroom or um, um, maybe an administrative cabin that's still in use. So that is that is a sign of a human occupation or a development and that would degrade this quality. Um, other examples could be temporary. You know, you might have scientific installation that is installed for a couple years, maybe five years or with the intention of it to be taken down or it's up for most of the year, but then is taken down um, for part of the year. So they can be permanent or temporary. Uh, they can be stationary like these two things, or they could be mobile like here, um, um, putting radio collars on animals that eventually come off and, and they also move around with the animals. Those could be examples of developments here, um, as well as, you know, the use of motorized or mechanized transport. Those are kind of all things that might degrade this undeveloped quality of wilderness character. So another thing worth noting is these are capturing developments, but that recreation developments, developments um, that facilitate recreation, like maybe a park, be a, a bench or a campsite pad, those were we cho chosen to be um, considered in another quality, this one here. So solitude or primitive and unconfined recreation. This is the fourth quality of wilderness character. Um, this one is, is capturing that wilderness has outstanding opportunities for solitude or a primitive and unconfined type of recreation. So uh, we use sometimes outstanding opportunities as um, for short for this quality. Um, but this is the quality with kind of the major connection um, of people to wilderness. Um, one of the words used a lot when describing wilderness is the word solitude. Um, and this is just, a, um, this quality kind of captures that collection of important direct benefits to the visitors. Um, so these aren't the only benefits, um, but these are the two that were specifically identified in the Wilderness Act, um, solitude or primitive and unconfined recreation. So they are important, but um, the solitude or primitive and unconfined recreation, it, it provides for, you know, that protection of the experience for self-reliance, you know, uh, relying on yourself to use um, a map and compass of a, of a new area, um, for self-discovery to go out maybe off trail or explore a new area without actually knowing exactly where it's going to take you. Um, providing for that physical and mental um, challenge, you know, doing doing that five, 10 or 20 mile day um, and, and challenging yourself to get through um, some big mileage days. And also kind of that freedom for societal obligations. You know, a lot of the wilderness may not have cell phone so service. So you're relying, um, you're, you're, you're free from the texts and the emails that you might usually get. Um, so that connection between visitors and nature.
So here's a couple examples of things that might degrade the solitude or primitive and unconfined recreation. Um, Peter had this guy in, in his slide as well. Um, this is Half Dome and just, just hiking a uh, far distance into a wilderness and, and coming to a line to and seeing that many people might degrade, you know, your sense of solitude. Um, if there's there's signs of vehicle use or ATV use in, in a wilderness, that kind of that reminder of outside um, human occupation and some of these other recreation develops uh, developments I mentioned that are kind of captured um, in this quality. Um, and degrading maybe some of that self-reliance, um, if there's maybe a sign that tells you how far to the next junction, things like that. Yeah, this is, all right, we'll go to the next one. The last quality of wilderness character is your other features of value. So straight from the act, uh, the other features of value, wilderness may also contain ecological, geological, or other features of scientific and educational, scenic, or historical value. So these are often uh, things that might not uh, fit nicely or be captured fully in some of the other five qualities, um, but these are, this quality is capturing things that are important to preserve um, in a wilderness um, or special features that contribute to the wilderness character. Um, these are often something that defines the world, the wilderness. Maybe the wilderness was named after a, a specific feature, um, or maybe the wilderness would be completely different if that feature weren't there. Um, so kind of those, those bigger other features of value. So here's a few examples of things that might degrade other features of value, um, like for, for monitoring purposes. Um, I guess it's important to note within the monitoring um, process, even if some of these are degraded by things outside of our control or outside of management control, they, they might still degrade the overall wilderness character. So here's an example of, you know, maybe a glacier where a wilderness like Glacier Bay was named after a specific glacier there. Um, that might be an other feature of value. It's important people go to that wilderness to see that glacier. That was kind of a defining feature for that wilderness. And, you know, this is a, a picture of more recently where that glacier is receding or melting and it's not there anymore. Um, and so the wilderness is might be different now that that, that feature is not there. So kind of those big, um, and that would degrade this quality, um, even if it's outside of our control. Um, a few of these others are, you know, some, this is a dinosaur bone, maybe someone extracting some of those archaeology or um, other resources from the area, you know, some graffiti or recent graffiti on some of those um, historical sites. Those are all some examples of, of degradations here. So these are kind of your iconic um, symbolic features of a wilderness, um, also, also containing your, your educational and your historic information about the wilderness. All right, so I know Peter had this slide too, but I think it is a good one after I talk about each of the five qualities of wilderness character to just kind of um, reiterate that each of these qualities um, are really impressive on their own. Um, you know, it, one wilderness might have, you know, just a great undeveloped character. Um, one might have really great untrammeled quality and, and a lot of landscapes might have that as well. But what makes wilderness really special um, and kind of unique is those qualities working together, you know, together they're extraordinary. Um, and that's kind of where you get that, that deep value of, of wilderness and, and how it's different than some of our other lands, public lands. Wilderness character is more than the sum of its parts. All right, so as you can imagine, and for folks who've worked with wilderness character um, for any amount of time, you will notice that some of these qualities can have um, be a little conflicting. So addressing, you know, the threat of of one quality might um, degrade or produce a threat for another quality. I think that's really apparent with, um, you know, the first one comes to mind, like the untrammeled and natural quality. When you're, for instance, if you have um, a, 
a monoculture of a non-native invasive species taking over an area, that's degrading the natural quality. But if you also address it with a management action and maybe decide to try to eliminate that species, that's that's a trampling action. And so those can have um, conflicting values. And so um, just kind of acknowledging that, you know, the decisions are not always super clear, but um, the things we do and the, the actions that we um, partake in can impact uh, multiple qualities. They can va vastly improve one quality and they might degrade another and just acknowledging that. Cool. And this is kind of summing up what I was just saying. So not taking an action might degrade um, the quality of wilderness character. Um, taking an action may degrade another quality. So any decision may improve or degrade those qualities. Just kind of summing up what I was just describing. Okay, so Peter described kind of the history of development of wilderness character. Um, and then I outlined some, you know, the, the definition of wilderness character in those five big buckets, you know, five qualities. And um, further developed was the wilderness character monitoring framework. Um, so this was a framework used to kind of address this mandate uh, in the Wilderness Act that the Wilderness Act, the, the uh, mandate is to preserve wilderness character. And so wilderness character monitoring framework allows us to do that, you know, with, with a specific kind of outline. And I'll just go over it a little briefly. But the only way to know if this, if, if this mandate is being fulfilled is to monitor it. And so that's what a lot of us are working on um, with implementing this wilderness character monitoring framework. All right. So this was just highlighting that the 2020 vision, you know, was kind of making wilderness character monitoring a priority over, you know, five plus years and implementing these baseline assessment reports in this wilderness character monitoring framework across all wildernesses in the National Wilderness Preservation System and something that um, my team works a lot on as well as a lot of folks probably on this call are working to implement um, wilderness character monitoring on their particular wildernesses, and um, we'll have an update on um, how that's kind of going within each agency after I'm done talking. Cool. So one of the great things about uh, wilderness character monitoring is it does provide information on wilderness character that is nationally consistent, um, which is important, you know, at at the higher level so that um, folks are wanting to invest in it and fund it um, and continuing it, but it also needs to be locally relevant um, so that the folks on the ground doing the implementing are also locally relevant and it's, and it's informative for each wilderness. Um, kind of each of these goals that I outline, um, these are the goals of wilderness character monitoring. Um, there was a lot of effort to by the agency, by the interagency team that Peter out, outlined um, to optimize wilderness character monitoring and to achieve all these goals, um, but that the monitoring program isn't perfect and just kind of also acknowledging that. Um, but yes, so some of the, the main goal, um, providing information that is nationally consistent and locally relevant, um, providing and showing accomplishment in preserving wilderness character. So there was, um, Kind of a sense over time that a frustration with management that there wasn't um, a tool that they could use or to to show that they were doing a great job of, of preserving wilderness character in, in their area and so now there's a tool that exists that we can see kind of over time how well are we doing at preserving wilderness character um, and then that third goal um, is to provide regional and national information that can be used to evaluate the policy effectiveness so you know is is it that um, the policy is not very good or is it that the policy is really good, but um, it wasn't really being implemented very well? So now by monitoring um, wilderness character and those trends over time, we'll be better able to answer that question. And then it also provides that information that will endure over time. So uh, Peter had mentioned that shifting baseline that you see in personnel. Um, someone who is working at a particular wilderness, you know, 25 years ago, came in um, maybe with a, the wilderness was very different at that time. And so over their 25 year career, they may have seen a lot of degradation or maybe a really increase in visitation or maybe um, a lot more use of 
motorized and mechanized vehicles. And so it seems very degraded, but then a new person who's just come in this year or just one year or even coming from a different location might come and say, oh, this is a very well preserved compared to, you know, what I know of wildernesses and other places. So just that shifting baseline and trying to um, get rid of people's perception of how it's changing over time and rather than to stick to kind of some data that's collected the same over time to see if that wilderness character is being preserved. And kind of that, that last bullet, um, it, it complements um, existing agency monitoring programs. Um, its goal is to use existing data, um, not to create brand new framework or brand new um, data that needs to be collected, but you, I mean, um, the agencies are already collecting a lot of information that informs wilderness character, like the air quality monitoring um, and the, the wildlife data. So there's a lot of existing data that can already be used to inform how well wilderness character is being preserved. Awesome. So it is important to note that wildernesses come on to this scale of wilderness character monitoring at different levels and that that's okay. So the goal of the this monitoring framework is to preserve wilderness character, like hold the line. And so one wilderness may come in here um, and another may come down here. So the state of, uh, it's important that the wildernesses kind of hold that line of wilderness character and don't slip down and degrade over time. So that's the goal. Um, it's okay if one, one comes in up here and one comes in down here, but the state at the time of designation is what we're trying to preserve. So some wildernesses might have um, a lot more degradation and some might have a lot more human influence, but just holding that line from de designation. So this is just kind of giving you an example of two very different wildernesses. Um, one is, you know, the Great Swamp just outside of New York City, um, maybe a smaller wilderness, one that uh, sees a lot of traffic. It's very close to urban areas. Um, it has a completely different ecosystem when um, compared to um, Gates of the Arctic in Alaska, um, much bigger, less visit visitation. But the, the goal of wilderness character monitoring is not to compare the two. That's, that is not the point of the modern framework, but rather to compare the wilderness to itself over time. So it's not about which one's more wildernessy, um, but about holding that line and making sure that the wilderness that we're talking about is not degrading over that timeline. So um, I defined for you kind of the wilderness character, what that definition is and what the inner, the agency team and all four agencies um, kind of agreed on that definition, the five qualities. Um, and then within that, you know, we'll get into the monitoring questions and indicators uh, later in this, in this week. But these four things are all nationally consistent. So that's what I was talking about within the framework these things are nationally consistent. We can use the same vocabulary to talk about um, wilderness character. There's a still, there's the um, similar framework across the agencies. So we can talk across agencies about um, how well we're preserving wilderness character over time. And then the locally relevant piece are the measures. So these measures can be um, developed by individual units, individual measures. Um, they, there might be agency recommendations for what measures you need to select on the ground, or there might be agency required measures that, that all the wildernesses need to select, or kind of a combination. So the way that measures were selected for each unit were um, somewhat determined by the agency as well as um, determined by uh, a, a local individual unit or wilderness. So these are the local relevant um, pieces of wilderness character. All right. So I'll stop sharing and I think we're gonna save questions for the end, but that is all I have, Jim. All right, all right, That's, that was quick, it looks like. So uh, we are gonna save questions for the end. So I guess we're a little ahead of time, but that's fine. And the next thing that we have is a WCM status update from our interagency wilderness steering committee. And for those of you who don't know what that is or are not involved, 
Uh, it's kind of a group that was set up to uh, provide coordinated national interagency leadership for both the Arthur Carhart, uh, I think it's the National Wilderness Training Center, and the Aldo Leopold Wilderness Research Institute, who train a lot of our wilderness rangers and stuff, so it's quite important. Because, uh, you know, as we said earlier, there's one National Wilderness Preservation System, and, and these, these uh, groups kind of serve all of them. So we're going to have updates from all the agencies, BLM, uh, Fish and Wildlife, and Park Service, but we're going to start off with uh, Peter Molly, who is our National Wilderness Program Manager at the U.S. Forest Service. If you're ready, Peter. Sure am. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Jim, right. and thanks to all of you. Can you hear me okay, everybody? Yep. Everything's Excellent. Great. So uh, it's great to be here. I'm really glad to see so many of you tuning in to this important subject. I'm going to share just a few slides with you. Uh, allow me to call up my presentation. One sec. All right. Does everyone see my cursor wiggling around? Looks good. Okay. So in a moment, I'm gonna jump into giving you a, a, just an overview of the progress of the Forest Service toward its, um, its goal of carrying out wilderness character monitoring. But before I do that, I just wanted to just give some basic context uh, for the Forest Service and the lands that it manages. So just uh, facts at a glance. So the Forest Service is part of the US Department of Agriculture and we manage 193 million acres and that is spread across more than 150 national forests, 20 national grasslands and one national prairie. So within that universe of 193 million acres, 37 million acres thereabouts of that Forest Service land is wilderness, a land designated by Congress uh, that displays those five qualities that Peter Landris and uh, Kate DeVrona have laid out so well. So for context, the 37 million acres of wilderness that Forest Service stewards is about 19% of all National Forest System or NFS land. We manage almost 450 wilderness areas across 39 states. So it truly is a, a nationwide program within the Forest Service. A bigger picture context in terms of where does the Forest Service portfolio fit into the, the larger National Wilderness Preservation System? We manage about one out of every three acres that are in the NWPS. So it's over 111 million acres in the National Wilderness Preservation System today. And it's a uh, little more than 800 areas total. So Forest Service manages one out of three, and we manage more than half of the total units. So with that, with that context, let me, let me get into the meat of what we are doing to carry out wilderness character monitoring. In terms of where we are, we have collected baseline data or are in the process of collecting baseline data on about 40% of our wilderness areas. So let me show you how that breaks down. Just a little guide to the uh, ring and its legend. Uh, the green here shows the total number of areas for which we have finished completing baseline data. And when I say that, it means that a, a unit, um, a, a district that has, let's say, a wilderness area, it has collected all of the, the data within the, the measures that it, it has selected. Uh, so 119 of those areas are done. Whereas 58 of the 448 total wilderness areas, 58 are in the process of collecting baseline data and they are, they are at one point or another toward completing the baseline data collection. And then lastly, this gray part of the ring here is everything else, is um, represents the, the areas that have not started for one reason or, or another. And um, there's, in a moment, I'll get into sort of the, the schedule that we laid out when we began this process for how we would 
finish collecting baseline data sort of year after year. So that that is the the breakdown. Um, the forty percent that I cited is basically the the twenty five, like twenty six percent that are done, and then this fifty eight is another the uh, thirteen percent. So it, it, if you round up, it's forty percent. So that's where I come up with that forty percent total. All right. In terms of sort of what what does this mean and where did we start? So back in 2018, the Forest Service began collecting wilderness character monitoring baseline data. And the target back then was that we would collect baseline data on 20% of our wilderness areas. And we would do that every year for five years. So 448 wilderness areas, 20% of that is about 90 areas. And the idea was that we would complete baseline data on about 90 areas per year and that we would be done by 2023. That was the goal. And I will return to that in a moment. But before I do, there's an important entity that plays an important role in how not just the Forest Service, but the, the four agencies, the four wilderness managing agencies carry out wilderness character monitoring. And that is the, the Interagency Wilderness Character Monitoring Subcommittee. Um, in brief, that entity is a subpart of the group that Jim Edmonds mentioned at the beginning, the Interagency Wilderness Steering Committee, which is that sort of uh, group that is meant to steer and facilitate the management of the National Wilderness Preservation System and as much as possible to manage the National Wilderness Preservation System as an integrated whole, not for individual agencies doing their own thing. So, uh, and I chair that steering committee, incidentally. So I'm gonna turn over um, the description of the Wilderness Character Monitoring Subcommittee to my colleague, uh, Julie King. And then when Julie is done, I will just wrap it up. Julie. Sure. So hi everyone. And um, so glad to be here today talking about Wilderness Character Monitoring. And I started with, um, with this group and with leading the central team in 20, the fall of 2018. And so I do lead the, the central team in supporting this work. Um, another role that I have is being the chair of the interagency steering committee. Um, we'll just say WCM subcommittee, it's a, it's a mouthful. Um, and just wanna mention the folks that are, that are in that group. So we have Roger Semler, who you're gonna hear from, from the parts for this, and also Aaron Drake. We have Nancy Roper, Peter Dratch, Marissa Edwards from the US Fish and Wildlife Service. We have Peter Keller from the BLM, and of course, Peter Molly, um, Jim Edmonds, and myself from the Forest Service. And just basically the subcommittee was set up with a charter to be an advisory board uh, body to the to the interagency steering committee on matters pertaining to wilderness character inventory and monitoring, and to encourage and support interagency coordination, conformity, fidelity to the approved WCM monitoring protocols and guidelines. So, so I think you're hearing from you know Peter Landris his you know presentation on on down through to this point just how critical that that interagency coordination and support is um, to the whole effort and the integrity of the National um, Wilderness Preservation System. So that's all I have, Peter. Great, thanks, Julie. So just to, to wrap up, um, in terms of where we go next, hang on. So our next steps, as I mentioned before, we are trying to finish collecting baseline data on our remaining wilderness areas. Uh, in doing so, we'll keep the agency's commitment to finishing collecting baseline data. We've had some challenges along the way, uh, a global pandemic being one, that's a budget uncertainty for the future being another. I'll leave it, I'll leave it there. Um, truth be told, it, unless the current pace changes, I think the forest service will need more time to finish data collection. Um, but what's important is that we, we do that job well and we do it thoroughly because ultimately our, our goal is to gain a clear picture about to what degree we are preserving wilderness character 
in each of our wilderness areas. And, and, and then eventually, once we have finished collecting baseline data and then monitored each one for five years to establish a trend, we will have a, a picture as to whether or not the wilderness areas that the Forest Service manages, the, whether the, the wilderness character in those areas is, is improving or staying stable, uh, or I hope this isn't the case, is, um, de is being degraded. So regardless of what that final answer is, once we have rolled everything up to a national picture, it's, it's a starting point. And we will hope to, uh, to use Kate DeVrona's, go back to her diagram from a few minutes ago, we will hope to be pushing uh, that point on the line up the slope closer to improved wilderness character. So I've put my, my email there uh, at the bottom of this slide. If you have questions that occur to you after this session, feel free to shoot me an email and I will, uh, I will get back to you. So with that, I'm gonna turn things over to my friend and colleague who is the Bureau of Land Management's National Wilderness Program lead, uh, Peter Keller. He is um, a part of the abundance of riches of Peter named, people named Peter in this presentation. So Peter Keller. Thank you, Peter Molly. It's great to be the, the third Peter on our lineup here today. Um, as you unshare your screen, I'll bring my screen on up. But uh, as Peter Molly mentioned, and we use a lot of last names here because uh, we obviously have all of the Peters. Um, hold on here. Go. Uh, so I've, I'm the National Wilderness Program Lead for the Bureau of Land Management. Uh, I've been here for about uh, nine months now. And um, with the headquarters team, I'm based in Reno, and that's where a lot of our staff are here for the National Conservation Lands. Other people you may have uh, worked with in the past, as this gets up there, um, also on the headquarters team is Bob Wick, our wilderness specialist based out of Sacramento. You've probably seen a lot of his photos. And also James Sippel, he's our uh, training representative at the Arthur Carhart National Wilderness Training Center. So that's our headquarters team. And if you talk to BLM people these days and we talk, we don't say what Washington office anymore because we're all based in different areas. And so headquarters is sort of our way of explaining it. All right, a little uh, background on the Bureau of Land Management. We have 260 wilderness areas. That's for 9.9 .9 million acres, and it's across 10 western states. So obviously that's much smaller than what Peter Molly just talked about for the, the Forest Service, but we're relatively new to the wilderness uh, field, to say, since we started in 1976 with our uh, naming legislation, FLIPMA. Um, as far as baseline assessments, we've completed a little under 50% of our baseline assessments across those 260 areas, so we're right around a 125 in that mark. Uh, still got a ways to go, obviously. And what we, a little bit different than we do in the Bureau of Land Management is that we have standard measures for all 260 wilderness areas. We have 25 measures, all 260 use the same 25 um, standard measures across the board. It's a little bit different where other agencies have more of a menu that you can select from, but we've just stood with a same sander across the, the board. And here's our map of uh, BLM wilderness areas. You can see we're primarily located in the, the Southwest and actually Southern California down there with all of those areas, they account for about 30% of the BLM's uh, wilderness preservation. And we overall, we have, there's 245 million acres of of wilderness or 245 million acres of land in the Bureau of Land Management and about 4% of that is designated wilderness. Uh, you've seen this slide a little bit today already um, with the Keeping It Wild uh, 2 front page there and we've developed our own guidance just as the other agencies have. Um, so it's tears off of Keeping It Wild 2. We have our own uh, implementation guide, version 2.0, that just came out about a year and a half ago. So this is the third version we've developed within the BLM. And so version 2.0 is the one that we currently use. And here's a list of our 25, almost all 25 of the measures. Um, you know, they follow the same areas as far as uh, qualities and indicators. But then as, as Kate was talking about, there's that sort of that fifth level of measures. 
And this is where we have separated out. We have our 25 standard measures, some of them, some of them collected annually, some five years, some centrally collected. Um, and then recently, we've been teaming up with the Forest Service for our jointly managed wilderness areas. We have a few dozen of those here out west. And we've been working with the Forest Service to develop the, the monitoring of these jointly uh, managed areas. And then Forest Service has been teamed up with the Society for Wilderness Stewardship and their wilderness fellows. So this has been a great partnership overall so far in Nevada and California. And this particular cover page is from Mount Charleston Wilderness in Southern Nevada. Uh, but we're also gonna start this year, hopefully in Oregon, Washington, in that region and that state office for, for BLM uh, to also team up with um, Forest Service and SWS. But these documents you know, run 100 plus pages, have a lot of great information. And it's, it's really almost like twice the work when you think of it, because if you got the Forest Service measures and then the BLM measures and they put it all together, but it's just great information for the managers to have. And I just wanted to wrap it up here with some uh, pictures of field work. So down in New Mexico, we have a field crew out. Um, they've been out all spring and they're still out here this summer. But this is an example of them collecting some data. This is on a, a agency created trail. They're collecting data and you can see a iPad in the person's hand. Um, and we also have another uh, photo of an example of some of the fun field work taking place out there. And this is a user created campsite in sort of a, a cave area. And these are all down in the Oregon mountains wilderness in Southern New Mexico. So that wraps up the, the BLM and we can wait for questions later on. I've had my contact information down there where you can reach me. Um, and I will now turn it over uh, to the Fish and Wildlife Service, to uh, Marissa Edwards, who is uh, standing in for Nancy Roper today. Uh, Nancy is out, but Nancy is the National Wilderness Coordinator for Fish and Wildlife Service. And I'll turn it over to, um, to, to Marissa to take over for that part. Now I just got to stop my share there. All right, over to you, Marissa. Thanks, Peter. Uh, yes, um, as you mentioned, uh, Nancy Roper, our national coordinator, able to make it today. So I will be presenting what Fish and Wildlife Service has been doing. Um, I'm a wilderness fellow. I've been a fellow for about five years um, and uh, solely working on wilderness character monitoring. Um, so I am going to share my screen. And I hope everybody can see that. Yeah, it looks good. Great. Okay, so let's get started. Um, I do have some photos in here. These are all photos taken on wilderness areas in the Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, um, but we'll go ahead. I'm going to tell you a bit about what we've done so far and what we're working on now. Um, as been mentioned many times already, we have these guiding documents for how we do wilderness character monitoring um, within all of the agencies, keeping it wild. Um, so Fish and Wildlife Service, um, as part of that uh, Wilderness Fellows Program, um, started in 2011 um, doing baseline assessments. Um, so we uh, selected our measures and we went out and uh, gathered all of our baseline data. Um, we only have 73 wilderness areas. We're, we're kind of the small fish, um, but we were able to complete all of those baseline assessments um, in 2015. But of course, Keeping Wild 2 came out in 2015, and um, that necessi necessitated that uh, required us to make some updates to our measures. Um, and since we still had the wilderness fellows working, um, we wanted to keep the momentum going. So we started right away in 2015 and started doing those updates. Um, so we currently have 30 of the 73 completed. We have another 30 in progress. That means we have uh, 13 left to do. After that, um, we initially hope to have all of them completed um, this year, um, but with the pandemic last year, that slowed us down a bit. So we're hoping 2022, um, we will have all of our updates completed. That will mean that, again, we will have all of our baseline uh, values collected. Um, and then we also have a agency specific guidance uh, document, which we call our survey protocol framework. Um, this came out in 2018. Um, from that document, we've started developing um, site-specific protocols. Um, this document is a one-stop shop. Um, it combines all of the information from the baseline assessment, 
the update document, the framework, and all of this keeping allowed to information into a single document that um, refuge personnel can use to do wilderness garage monitoring on the wilderness area. Um, we started the first one last year. Um, we now have several in progress, none completed yet, but we're hoping to have our first ones completed soon. Um, so we intend to do um, that for all 73 wilderness areas as well. Um, since we've now been doing this about 10 years, uh, we've been entering our data. We have an interagency database. The Wilderness Fellows um, entered the initial measures and baseline values into that database. Um, and then the way that we've done it in Fish and Wildlife is a data steward is selected at each wilderness refuge, and they're responsible for entering the monitoring data um, going forward. Um, we do a data call annually in January, and those data stewards go in and enter their values. Um, we're really early stages, starting to be able to do some trend reports. Um, we only, I would say about half a dozen of our wilderness areas have been able to do trend reports. Um, so we can't say too much about it yet. We're hoping in the next couple of years, we'll be able to look at some uh, regional reports, trends, um, and, and maybe even um, looking at all of our wilderness area trends and saying something about what's happening with wilderness character for Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, and I'm just going to really quickly show you a little snapshot of uh, what that trend report looks for. This is for Okefenokee Wilderness, which might be one of our most well-known um, refuges and wilderness areas. Um, and this is just looking at the untrammeled quality. Um, but they're one of the very first ones that can do a trend report. So we're excited to see um, what we're going to learn from these. And that's it for my presentation. Um, I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to the National Park Service now. Um, Roger Sumler is going to talk. Uh, he's the National Wilderness Stewardship Program Manager. I'm going to just stop my share. Hello, everyone. I will share my screen with you all here. Uh, thank you for the uh, invitation to participate with you today. Um, I'm Roger Semler, the National Wilderness Stewardship Program Manager for National Park Service. I'm based in Missoula, Montana, uh, but I am assigned to the Visitor and Resource Protection Directorate in the Washington office. Uh, there's my email at the bottom there and my phone number, and I welcome anyone to follow up with me at a later date if you'd like to discuss any of the information I'm sharing. Uh, first, I wanted to share a couple of uh, important policies that we have established in the National Park Service uh, that relate to wilderness character monitoring. Uh, the first one is in our general policy uh, where we def define what we mean by wilderness with respect to what do our policies apply to. And in the case of the National Park Service, our policies not only apply to designated wilderness, but they also apply to the categories of eligible, steady, proposed, recommended wilderness as well. And based on that um, interpretation of how we're applying our policies, we strive to conduct wilderness character monitoring in all of these categories, uh, not just in designated wilderness. Also in uh, our director's order 41, which was last updated in 2013, we do uh, have an affirmative statement that says wilderness parks will conduct a wilderness character assessment, which includes identifying what should be measured, establishing baseline data, and conducting ongoing monitoring of trends. Um, I wanted to share with you uh, some uh, metrics regarding our wilderness inventory in the National Park Service. And if you look at the pie chart here, you'll see on the left side in the green uh, is our designated wilderness. We have 61 areas designated by Congress. Those are located within 50 National Park Service units. 
which means a few national park units have more than one designated wilderness, such as Lake Mead National Recreation Area. And that accounts for 44.4 million acres. By the way, as uh, probably come as no surprise, the vast majority of those acres are in Alaska, about 33 million acres of our designated wilderness are in our vast Alaska National Park units. And then in addition to the designated, we have the eligible proposed and recommended wilderness. And those are um, in 50 additional MPS units, and that accounts for 26.3 million acres. When you tally all that up, uh, designated plus eligible proposed and recommended, uh, we're over 70 million acres and uh, over uh, approximately 83% of all National Park Service acreage is managed as wilderness pursuant to either law for designated or policy for the other categories. Uh, this slide just depicts the uh, current status. We've been conducting wilderness character monitoring for well over five years now. Admittedly, we have uh, struggled with our capacity. We do not have any full-time dedicated positions to wilderness character monitoring in, in the National Wilderness Program. But here are some statistics uh, regarding where we stand right now. And included, including um, the uh, baseline assessment and final baseline report, we also include uh, what we refer to as wilderness character narratives in our wilderness character monitoring protocol. And so we have a number of those done and, and a number of those also in uh, final draft form. So when you tally all this up, we're running at about a 50% completion rate for all of the uh, inventory that I shared with you in that earlier slide. I wanted to share with you a few of the resources that we've applied to wilderness character monitoring. One, of course, is policy development. I showed you two key policies, but most importantly right now, we are working on our wilderness character monitoring technical guide. That is being done through an interdisciplinary work group chartered through the National Wilderness Leadership Council that the Park Service has established. Um, we're uh, uh, well into that process but uh, have yet to complete or have an approved wilderness character monitoring technical guide, uh, which is badly needed. We have been very aggressive with training. Uh, we, a few years ago, established a three-day training uh, in person uh, for Park Service personnel known as the Preservation of Wilderness Character Training. And that's been very popular and very successful, and it has served as a means to try to educate, inform, and encourage National Park units to pursue their wilderness character monitoring work. We've also conducted a number of park interdisciplinary workshops where we'll literally go to a park unit, host a two or three day workshop to help build out their wilderness character monitoring program and protocols. We uh, also have used uh, for several years now, the Wilderness Fellows Program, Currently, we're engaged in what is known as the MPS Scientists and in Parks Internship Program, the SIP program. These uh, involve 20-week uh, internships, and they're conducted in collaboration and managed in collaboration with a uh, conservation legacy organization. And lastly, we've developed a couple of briefing statements and briefing papers that we try to share service-wide and with other partners. One being the Wilderness Character Monitoring um, resource brief and the other one being the Wilderness Character Building Blocks resource brief. And I believe those are attached in chat for you or at least uh, Kate was going to attach them for you. And then of course we have the Keeping It Wild in the MPS user guide. Uh, Peter, Peter Landris referred to that earlier in his presentation. And that has given us some uh, preliminary guidance on pursuing wilderness character monitoring. Uh, but once again, we, we really need the technical guide to refine our protocols and our procedures for wilderness character monitoring into the long run. 
And I'll close with just uh, touching on a couple of challenges and lessons learned. Um, first off, our priority uh, thus far in the way we're going about our technical guide is that the number one priority would be to inform wilderness planning, management, and operations at the park level. In fact, when a park unit pursues a wilderness stewardship plan, which is also required by policy, we encourage that park to complete their wilderness character monitoring framework first before engaging in the planning process. While we also see the importance of rolling up uh, trends uh, into a national or interagency uh, level roll up, uh, right now our emphasis is on informing individual park units and encouraging them to complete their baseline assessments. We are also in our, in our uh, technical guide working group uh, we're having significant discussion about the concept of standardized measures versus flexible measures. And that is yet to be fully uh, refined as we work through the process. But there's very, uh, very vigorous conversation going on on, the, on that question. We've also identified in terms of lessons learned, some problematic indicators, at least some park units have struggle with these. One is the, the um, standardized indicator of unauthorized trammeling or trammeling that was not authorized by the agency. And parks have struggled to find reliable and legitimate measures for that particular indicator. The other one is uh, that has evolved here recently is use of inholdings as an indicator. And there have been some issues that have uh, resulted from the uh, standardized indicator of inholdings. I'd be happy to follow up with anyone individually if you want to talk more about inholdings. And last, uh, wilderness character monitoring capacity continues to be a challenge for the National Park Service. We do not have a dedicated wilderness character monitoring coordinator position at the national level. Um, we have submitted a uh, request for FTE and funding for that, but that is yet to be approved. And then last, one of the things we have noticed for some of the early, the parks that completed their baseline assessments at an earlier date, uh, there has been a tendency for parks to uh, lose track of their uh, five-year cycle or have it flagged in a manner where they know what's coming up in terms of the monitoring and identifying of trends and so forth at the five-year cycle. So we're trying to find uh, new and improved ways and means to flag that and to remind parks uh, when those uh, dates come up. I think one reason that happens is there's turnover in parks and some of the people may have, that may have been involved at the initial stage have moved on. And so that's just something we're trying to uh, reckon with. I will close there and thank you all very much. And I'm happy to engage in any questions that, as we move into the Q&A phase. All right, thank you, Roger. Thank you, interagency reps for that update. And now it is, uh, gosh, a little bit early, so that's good because this is gonna, gonna be interesting. So we have, uh, as we said, we've been monitoring the chat channel for questions. Uh, so we're gonna have a little Q&A with our speakers right now. Uh, we're gonna start with one of the questions from our chat. I think it's gonna be, Drew Lindsay is gonna present this. He is the uh, WCM data services specialist on our forest service WCM team. Uh, you ready, Drew? Got a good one? Yeah, absolutely. And All right. thanks again to our speakers. Um, Peter, Kate, Peter, Julie, Peter, Marissa, Roger. That was great and just an awesome reminder, you know, how this interagency work all comes together. Um, so if you guys were following along in the chat, I'm sure you've seen it already. And um, uh, we'll, we'll start with a question from there. Um, Griff had uh, brought up uh, asking uh, essentially, um, is the public able to view the baseline assessment reports um, that from the completed um, WCM pro pro uh, projects? 
I guess I can I can start. Um, so if you are following the chat, you'll see that it does vary by agency. So right now the Forest Service doesn't have a central location that's accessible to the public for all the baselines. And they actually are, um, we recognize the region and the local, you know, I guess ability to, to share those in a way they feel comfortable. So whenever we get a national request, we usually um, go back to the regions and suggest that they work with them because sometimes they do have them on their public website. Um, but we are working, you know, towards having, you know, we talked about our Wilderness Connect as being maybe a, a spot that eventually could house baselines if they're all 508 compliant. And um, so that's something a little bit out in the future. But I guess I'll let, I'll let other agencies respond. Marissa, you had a comment in the chat. Yeah, um, so uh, Fish and Wildlife Service has a um, digital repository for documents on our service catalog, which we refer to as ServCat. Um, we've been diligent about um, entering all of our wilderness character monitoring documents on that um, service catalog, including baseline assessments. Um, in the chat, I included a link um, to the program for the wilderness character monitoring documents. Um, not all of these are accessible externally, but many are, so take a look. Um, I believe most of our baseline assessments um, can pull up the PDF and, and read it and see see what the wilderness fellows developed. Um, but um, yeah, if there are any questions um, for a specific um, wilderness, feel free to email me. I'll share two uh, two things on behalf of the Park Service. Uh, one, uh, we do not have a centralized uh, place to post them for public dissemination right now. Uh, certainly individual parks have the prerogative to post on their park website. That's not very common, but there's no prohibition on that. Uh, it, but however, also things that we post for public dissemination do need to be 508 compliant. And so that's just a little reminder in terms of how we render these documents for that purpose. For BLM, we don't have any of our baseline assessments in a central location. I mean, we hope to someday, but we don't yet. Hey, everybody. Just uh, while Drew goes through these questions that we've collected in the chat, uh, just a reminder, if you have any additional, you can raise your hand in the, in the Zoom meeting so that we can get to you. Thank you. We also have a, another question that's uh, intuitive for all of the interagencies. Um, why aren't all four agencies using the exact same measures for WCM work? And maybe I should jump in on that one since that's kind of a ground floor question. Um, Absolutely, Peter. Yes, yeah, so it's a, it's a very good question. It's an obvious question. It's one that we asked ourselves, I don't know, 5,000 times, probably at least. That's an exaggeration, probably 500 times. Um, the bottom line is that every agency has a different set of data that they've already collected. And one of the goals that Kate, Caitlin talked about was we need to just to make a practical system of national monitoring, we need to tie into agency data as much as possible. And so that is not standardized across the four agencies at all. And the really kind of at heart reason is if we wanted to have it stand, have standardized data collection across all four agencies, we would have to find the bottom line denominator. You know, what's the weak, uh, it ends up being what is the weakest link um, that's gonna, for data that would be commonly available across all four agencies. And we'd basically have, well, this is overstating a bit, but we'd have um, crap for data to actually use to evaluate trends in wilderness character. And so we made a decision um, in consultation with uh, several different statisticians that we could slice and dice this if we allowed each of the agencies to assign their own measures and, and you've seen variation in, in how the agencies are going about it, whether like for the BLM standardize across all their wildernesses or let each, each of the individual wildernesses roll their own within an agency. By developing a, a, a very uh, precise protocol framework um, of qualities, 
indicators. And then the measures could be chosen by the individual, I mean, all the way down to an individual wilderness. And then we, and the key is, and this was this, what the statisticians on our teams came up with is we don't compile the data per se from a measure, we compile the trend. So this is just an absolutely key um, aspect of allowing us to let each of the agencies, indeed, even all of the individual wildernesses, if, they, if the agency allowed it, to use their own measures, use their own data, and then we compile the trend, not the data, but the trend of that measure into the protocol framework. And um, there are a bunch of other uh, major national scale um, U.S. national scale monitoring programs that are functionally doing the same thing. And so um, it's a, it's a super important question to address upfront. We have thought about it just in excruciating detail uh, because it's an obvious question that we just got hit over the head with immediately as soon as we started rolling this um, national framework out. And so we do have, have, I think it's a very appropriate answer. Um, and in a bottom line is just practically and tangibly to get to pull off a interagency national scale monitoring program, it's one of the things that are necessary. You know, in an ideal world, we would have standardized measures across every single wilderness, um, but just the different types of ecosystems, different use levels, different management paradigms that are going on within each of those wildernesses, just practically, it's just not feasible to do that. So we came up with a system that balances the national needs, regional needs, allowing the local wildernesses to you know, roll their own measures um, and, and then also allow those local wildernesses to have data that's directly relevant and practical for that individual wilderness. So sorry for the long-winded answer. It's a, it's, it was a, it's a complicated topic that uh, kind of touches a bunch of different aspects. So that's it. Uh, this is Peter Malley. I just wanted to supplement Peter Landers's answer. Either Peter Landris's presentation or Kate's had a phrase that I love, which is that the, well, part of this is my phrasing. The beauty of the protocol is that it is uh, nationally consistent and locally relevant. So you can roll it up to get an overall picture, but when it gets down literally to on the ground, you can choose measures that are relevant, either because you're already collecting that data or someone in your agency is, or it's because it's a big deal. That can BLM. Grazing is a is a grazing in wilderness is a big deal, not so much in the national parks. Um, that's just one example because I, I used to I used to be I used to be Peter Keller. Um, I I I'm Peter Keller's predecessor, so I can speak a little bit to BLM. Um, so I just think that's a, a very pithy phrase: nationally consistent and locally relevant. I I would just add uh, to you know your. Uh, Grazing example is a good one. If you really, really looked into it, you'll find a number of examples of different management practices that are all legitimate based on that particular agency. For example, in National Park Service, we tend, at least in the lower 48, we tend to have mandatory wilderness permits for overnight wilderness use. That's very prevalent in the Park Service and less prevalent in some of the other agencies. So there, there are many, many uh, manage, managerial uh, differences in, um, across our agencies. Excellent, much appreciated for those answers. Um, we had another question that just came in that seems especially relevant, talking about interagency cooperation. Uh, Lee Hughes has asked um, that their main problem is sens uh, data sensitivity with acquiring locations and current statuses of cultural resources. Um, and that requires a large amount of agency cooperation. Um, do we have any solutions or any recommendations for, for that question? Um, I'll, I'll, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. I'll be really quick. Um, just from a fish and wildlife standpoint, um, that is the type of information that we would not make publicly accessible. We usually put it in a separate document. So while those baseline assessments are on our service, cat service catalog, that really sensitive information, and it may not be cultural resources, it can be endangered species, it could be all kinds of things, we would keep that in a separate document um, that is not accessible.
Did Peter Landers have some more to add to that answer? No, Marissa just hit it uh, she just on it. the head. Boom. Yeah, it was good. Yeah, I'll just add kind of historical context. Um, there's been quite a bit of acrimony in the past between cultural resource or heritage programs and the wilderness programs for a bunch of different reasons. And the wilderness character work forced us at a pretty high level to grapple with that acrimony. And, you know, a bunch of us kind of were shaking our heads going, you know, wilderness protects cultural resources, you know, like, uh, you know, we should be working together. And just we kind of ran into a buzzsaw. Um, I organized a uh, a whole uh, a national conference symposium on this exact topic of cultural and resources and wilderness um, with uh, someone who is the cultural resource lead in the park service. And, you know, picture 200 people in a room. We, uh, she and I open up the conference. And people start yelling at each other, like in the audience. And we're going, ah, you know, it's like, this is a worst case scenario. Um, so we actually ended up uh, after about a half hour trying to control it and people were really pissed, uh, people were upset with each other. And so we ended up just like, can't we leave, everybody leave, we need to, it was like really ugly. So the Forest Service technical guide that was just recently published last year does a really careful, thorough, capable job of describing the role of cultural resources in wilderness and how to monitor cultural resources in a very culturally sensitive and appropriate manner. And so I would refer people to that document. It's the most current document that I'm aware of. The Park Service especially has some really um, important roles to play with cultural resource management and was really the leader um, in pushing all of us to address and accept the importance of cultural resources in wilderness character monitoring. So kudos to the Park Service for doing that. Um, the Fish and, Wild Fish and Wildlife Service with their commitments for endangered species really jumped forward um, and to address the issues there also. So I would encourage those people who are interested to look at the Forest Service document for cultural resources. And then also the documents that Roger referenced in the Park Service have extensive write-ups on the uh, importance and the role and the mechanics of cultural resource monitoring as part of um, wilderness character monitoring. All right, very good, thank you. Those are the um, significant questions that we had prepared for um, this session. Um, I'm gonna um, flip it back to Jim Edmonds, our moderator, and we'll open it up for some more Q&A for the time we have remaining. Thank you all. Hey, that sounds good. I don't see any raised hands, but I do see another couple of questions in the chat. So I'm gonna go ahead and get to those. I think the first one, oh no, I've got to scroll back because Griff was asking a, uh, had a different tack on her question about public data. Uh, and once we have, once we actually have a trend, I think uh, she's asking if we will be able to put the small trend reports in some kind of publicly accessible location, maybe, uh, I guess we're saying instead of going through the 508 compliance process with the entire baseline report, whether our trend data alone would be publicly accessible. And I'm anticipating this might have a different answer at every agency as well. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn it up to the group. Um, I guess I'll, I'll start it off. And um, Peter, Molly, if you have any other thoughts, please contribute. But to me, it's kind of the same as um, where we're at with baselines, the intent is totally to be able to share these things and for them to be able to be accessible. So, you know, I would hope by the time we are, you know, getting um, a bunch of trend assessments done that we maybe have that figured out and have those posted where people can, um, can access them. And it might still differ by agency, but I think it would be something we try to be thoughtful about making them available and in, in the easiest way. That's, I, the only thing I would add to that Julius, if I'm understanding the question correctly, rather than wait five years to establish, um, rather than monitor each and every single area for five years and then and only then uh, determine the trend, can you do it 
uh, sooner, like maybe after two years. I, I think it will depend on a number of factors, including just the, the resources available to do that work. There is, there is an opportunity cost to doing that. And this is my impression that the opportunity cost would be time spent rolling up a mini trend report is time better spent right now, at least, finishing collecting the baseline data. So that, that all could change in the future. But um, I, I guess I would say at this point, I, I hadn't contemplated uh, putting out a trend report sooner than after we have five years worth of monitoring data on the last wilderness area for which we collect baseline data, whenever that is. Hey, 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 Griff! If you want to, uh, if you want to vocalize your question, you're you're welcome to do it. You don't have to go go through us. <laughs> we're getting okay. we're going to get it wrong. I know it. Go ahead. Well, it, really, it is. I want to know <laughs> that that there's a plan. The plan is I've seen it in keeping it wild, right? I've seen it. The plan is to roll up to the regional and national level and report every five years. Okay, so we're gonna, in theory, we're gonna get all of the baselines done in every agency. And in theory, in five years from the time they're all done, in theory, you are gonna do those roll-ups. And so the roll-ups, the documents get smaller and smaller and smaller. And so the accessibility issue becomes very easy. They're, I mean, they're, they're small documents. But I guess I, I want to advocate for seriously considering making that information publicly available instead of me having to email every single forest or every single park and say, can I have your thing? I mean, that just, I mean, I could FOIA everything, but that's like a dumb way to go. So I, I mean, we want to talk about the whole national wilderness preservation system which means all of those other pieces have to come. So we might be 10 years from now, but I want there to be, I want to encourage us to think about a real plan. That's all. Yeah, and I can say that we agree and we're, we are, we're doing that or we are taking steps to do that. And um, it, it, that is an important component of the, of the whole protocol. Um, the one caveat being what, what was mentioned earlier, certain data like the presence of cultural resources, sensitive cultural resource sites, that may be an exception. But, but yes, sharing the overall trends, that, that as you say, in Keeping Wild too, that, that, is the, that is the intent, that this is not you know, PII or something. So, yes. All right, thanks, Peter. Uh, good, good to have that perspective on the, on the group. Well, it looks like we're getting towards the end of our time. We're actually past it. Oh gosh. So I guess we should go ahead and adjourn. I want to thank all of our speakers and all of our attendees. And I hope there's nothing I'm missing. So see you I guys just, all later. Right? Hey Jim, right. it good. looked like good. Peter, it looked like Peter Landris had, did you have something in closing, Peter? Yeah, if we have time, if we don't have time, I can just make a note in the chat but I just want yeah I, if we have like just a minute I have a comment we do go ahead okay so I wanted to address Louis um, Shahan Shahan from the Forest Service had a question that I thought was just really interesting that I think is a, really appropriate for the interagency WCM subcommittee to mull over and it's something that we never addressed in the development or historical development of wilderness character monitoring because we were just grappling with the bigger issues of how do we get this thing rolling and moving but now that we're and I think this relates to Griff's um we, I have, I've been talking with Griff for years about the issues um you know the a, a real important goal for this is to be public. Um, and so I think Louis' idea is really interesting. There might be a way to think of how to stream. I, I don't know the answer to this at all, folks, but there might be a way to streamline what we're doing because um, we really tried to develop the whole enchilada 
um, oh, I'm sorry, the whole the whole package um, originally. And so maybe there's a way now with some hindsight to actually streamline it. And then that would um, also be a way to address, I think, the really poignant concerns that Griff is raising is that our intent was always from the get-go to have public access to the information because agencies change both by pulling from within from staff within and pushing from the public outside the agency. So we always wanted to have public access to the data. So maybe there's some streamlined ways to think about it. Yeah, I, I just throw it out there as just you know, let's all, you know, put our heads together, or you guys put your heads together, I'm retired, um, think about, um, you know, what you guys might be able to put together to facilitate that. So anyway, I just wanted to comment on that. Sorry if I've pushed over our time limit. I don't think it's too bad. All right, everybody, with that, I guess that concludes our session. Thank you, everybody, and our Zoom, our Zoom coordinator, who's been in the background doing yeah. everything. Right. See you guys. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate your interest.